All right. 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 Uh, anal fishers! Sophie, was that is that how you start a podcast? I mean, yeah. I mean, technically, uh, we, I mean, this podcast. We sure. We did it. That was because normally if I'm shouting a disease, it's going to be like diphtheria or syphilis. But I decided to throw a wild card in this time. Um, although I could have given the topic today, it might have been appropriate to just shout Hitler. Uh, I mean, I thought that's where you were going, but then you didn't do it. And now I'm confused. Well, H- Hitler did have a lot of weird butt problems. So it, it scans. <laughs> this is Behind the Bastards, a podcast where we talk about the worst people in all of history and the things behind them. And today's episode is one of the latter. My guest today is Langston Kerman from uh, The Boys and from Insecure. Langston, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fantastic. And what an intro. What and mainly Thank you. the start. I love the way you start your show. This is Mm-hmm. fantastic we're professionals here langston and the way professionals open shows is by immediately before the show starts shouting out the ne- name of a disease illness or just atonally shrieking um mm-hmm. langston yeah. knows langston has a podcast mm-hmm. i do have a podcast that's true it's uh it's about black people and our conspiracy theories uh i rarely yell anal fishers but i'm learning a lot today and maybe that's something i'll incorporate langston one of my really good friends cody del rosario he texted me he's like you gotta listen to this podcast and i'm like and tell- <laughs> it's your show and i'm like yeah that's kind of on our network and i will Hell yeah. Yeah, so Well Langston, <laughs> you 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 just as you just said, you do a show about conspiracy theories. Um That's right. And today we're talking about the conspiracy theory that kind of started all modern conspiracy theories. We're going mm. back to the source, the 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 origin point for like QAnon, for like the NWO, the Illuminati conspiracies, all of that shit, all that Bill Cooper stuff starts with the subject of today's episode. Uh, we are talking about the protocols of the elders of Zion. Whoa. Uh, yeah. You, you heard anything about that? <laughs> no, but I just love uh, a lot of fancy words strung together oh, in yes. a way that oh, I'm yes. enjoying. <laughs> this is one of the most influential pieces of dangerous conspiratorial nonsense ever created. It has gotten millions of people killed, like 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 a death toll that that your average dictator would struggle to or your average American president, for that matter, would struggle <laughs> struggle to match. Like this is this thing has gotten so many fucking a real people, Jimmy so. Carter worth of numbers. I got you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love that Jimmy Carter is your yardstick for a president who gets a lot of people killed. Uh, the greatest murderer of all time, I would say. Yeah, Jimmy Carter, history's <laughs> greatest monster. Um, yeah, you can see in his eyes as he feverishly builds houses that he's just desperately <laughs> trying to weigh down his debt to humanity. <laughs> Those bruises are coming from the inside, is what I always say. <laughs> His soul <laughs> boiling out of him. Uh, so, as you're well aware, as all of our listeners are well aware, we live today in an age of conspiracies, real and theorized. I think about half of the country, uh, probably about half of the world, lives in a semi-permanent state of conspiratorial obsession. And mm-hmm. a lot of these folks are right, you know? Um, for example, there's a ton of black people today who remember personally what the FBI Pro like programmed into the civil rights movement the black Panthers. absolutely there's people all over the arab world and in latin america who lost family members and lived in chains for decades because of conspiracies cooked up or funded by the cia it a lot of people have been victims of real conspiracies so when i say we live in a world of conspiracies it's not all nonsense um so i would say the great plague of our modern world isn't that a lot of people believe in conspiracies because a lot of people have a good reason to the thing that's slowly tearing our society apart which is kind of perfectly embodied by QAnon and the terminal case of fascist brainworms that it spread to millions of americans is something different it's called conspiracism this term was popularized by a scholar named frank mintz in the 1980s he defined conspiracism as belief in the primacy of conspiracies in the unfolding of history In other words, the idea that conspiracies or a conspiracy is a moving, the primary moving factor in the history of a nation or the world, that's conspiracism. It's demonstrably false because the vast majority of shit that happens happens pretty much out in the open, right? There's all these different, like, like, like for, with the with the case of like kind of white supremacy in the United States, there's a bunch of FBI conspiracies and stuff you can point to. But the history of white supremacy is mostly pretty open. Like most of it's not really all that hidden. It's just like the way things fucking work and stuff. Um, but so you've got 
these real conspiracies, conspiracism is believing that everything that happens is tied to a conspiracy in some mm. way, as opposed to this them being kind of fragments of, of the reality that we live in. As Frank Mintz wrote, conspiracism serves the needs of diverse political and social groups in America and elsewhere. It identifies elites, blames them for economic and social catastrophes, and assumes that things will be better once popular action can remove them from positions of power. And I think that gets to the key difference between believing in conspiracies and conspiracism. If you understand like that the FBI and the CIA carried out and still engage in a variety of conspiracies to fuck up a bunch of things, you probably don't believe that just getting rid of one of those organizations will solve all of the world's problems. Like it'd be rad to get rid of the CIA and the FBI, but it wouldn't stop Turkey from ethnically cleansing the Kurds or Azerbaijan by ethnic from ethnically cleansing Armenians. It wouldn't fix climate change overnight. It wouldn't stop our world from accelerating into an uninhabitable mess. Conspiracists believe that like, yeah, if you get this conspiracy out of the way, like that's the QAnon thing, right? If we can get rid of this cabal of evil child eating pedophiles, we we'll solve all <laughs> of the world's problems. Everything will be fixed. We just have to solve this. It's kind of an optimistic worldview when you really think about it. Conspiracism, because it believes that there's a magic bullet that can fix everything. So, yeah, uh, scholar and you like it's it's clear why conspiracism is particularly um attractive today because all of our pro we have so many problems and they're all so complex and they all like have tendrils not just into these different government organizations and different like cabals and whatnot but they have all these tendrils into like just the way we live our lives right it'd be nice if there was like one group of e small one small group of evil men making climate change happen but it's largely tied to the fact that we all kind of live the lives that we live and we have all these systems that ensure that we're going to continue pumping carbon into the atmosphere and that's hard to fix like you can't I mean, just that like would be dope if it was just like those some three dudes and you were just like oh you're fucking something yeah up. all right bye yeah yes i and i maintain that it is three dudes mostly so that i don't have to work on me but that yeah <laughs> that's the personal work that i'm avoiding I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's two there's two like there's the there's that like oh seven companies responsible for like 80 percent of the carbon emissions like that's true but they're doing it because of the way we all because, for example, we all need to drive a car because we right. for years like allowed fossil fuel companies to destroy any chance at functional public transport in a large chunk of the world or like, um, you know, yeah, yeah. Like you can tie a lot of emissions to Amazon, but Amazon is emitting because we all want our second day delivery and shit like there's sure. it's, it's all more complicated than just like Jeff Bezos bad. He is. Oh, he's you know, terrible. He's but terrible. I also, but <laughs> I also bought a, uh, a bunch of fruit leather the other day from Amazon, yeah. and I didn't have to do that. I didn't no. need that you, product. <laughs> you wanted the fruit leather, and so you I got really it. wanted that fruit. That leather. Was so specific. <laughs> <laughs> Did I need a hundred pieces of fruit leather? Absolutely not. That's on me, Jeff Bezos. We all we all have <laughs> our fruit leather in this discussion, you know. Um, yeah, so scholars Seymour Lipset and Earl Robb wrote that the typical conspiracy theory is international in scope, extends both in space and time, dates back in history, and is destined to endure forever. And that's kind of what separates an actual conspiracy. You know, you can look at real conspiracy and like, okay, well, at this date, the CIA launched a plan to overthrow the democratically elected president of Guatemala and mm. backed death squads and stuff. And like, there's a beginning and an end and a scope, a limited scope to the conspiracy, a conspiracy theory. There's no limit. It goes on forever. It goes back in time forever and it will never, it, it, it will endure forever. Alex Jones, for example, believes in a globalist conspiracy that stretches literally back into prehistory. A small group of a few thousand insiders, depending on what day he's talking about it, have been working for millennia to enslave and eliminate <laughs> the human race. Destroying these globalists will solve every problem that humans have, but in Alex's estimation, their precise member roster is always changing, and their plans are always about 10 years away from completion. So like, no matter what you do, it's always there. It's always, if you could just solve the problem, everything would be better, but you never do. That's a fucking conspiracy theory in the, in the modern sense of the word q believers on the other hand tend to tie every problem of their lives and nationwide to this cabal that's fighting donald trump in magical combat and yeah like it it it, it links up with all these different shit we've talked about this a lot on the show historian daniel pipes laid out a short list of characteristics that virtually all conspiracy theories have in common power is the goal Benefit indicates control, conspiracies drive history, nothing is accidental or foolish, and appearances deceive. Right? One of the big like key cat like tenets of QAnon is that there are no coincidences. Mm -hmm. Um and part of this is just because like, man, fucking 
wild shit happens in the world. You know, sometimes the Archduke of Austria, Hungary is trying to get a sandwich or is what is like driving down the street and a guy at a sandwich shop shoots him and then 20 million people die. And that's just the way the fucking world goes. <laughs> but conspiracy. No, it's got to be. You know, this guy was a part of like he was a part of an organization, but it was like just a bunch of poor Serbians. But they've got to imagine, no, it was part of this. There's people pulling the strings. The Rothschilds needed it to happen. And like, sure. Yeah, there's babies in that pizza shop. Yeah, there's, there's babies in that babies pizza, in shop. The pizza shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just people talking about cheese pizza. It's got to be. Yeah. Nazism, as it, at its heart, was a conspiracist theology. All of Germany's problems could be laid at the feet of international Jewry, who were responsible not just for German defeat in World War I, but for the overthrow of the Tsars and the establishment of the USSR. When the war turned against the Nazis, Hitler and his high command diverted crucial war resources towards fueling the extermination camps in the East because eliminating the Jews was for them a military priority. Not all conspiracist beliefs center around the idea of an international Jewish conspiracy, but conspiracism itself has its origins intricately tied to anti-Semitism. And in the most con successful conspiracy theory ever made in human history, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Mm. The concept of grand conspiracies is not particularly old as these things go. Conspiracy theories, grand conspiracy theories, go back about 900 years and have only really become operational in the last 200 years. The inciting incident for the birth of all modern grand conspiracy theories is the French Revolution. This makes sense when you really think about it. One of the world's great powers, the most powerful military force in the world at the time, the most established monarchy in the world, is overthrown seemingly overnight and replaced with a radical left-wing government. Bloodletting and chaos ensues. Many people felt the changes that swept France couldn't possibly have been the result of long-simmering unrest and kingly incompetence. It couldn't be the king was dumb, he fucked up. People took their chance and they got lucky and things just worked out and they overthrew the government. It couldn't be mm -hmm. that. It has to be some some cabal was plotting this. <laughs> and unfortunately, for just a whole lot of people, the birth of modern conspiracy theories happened to very neatly coincide with something else. The birth of modern anti-Semitism. So these two things are really happening right at the same time. When I talk about modern anti-Semitism, not just talking about like it's it's what is the difference between racism and anti-Semitism? Anti-Semitism is a type of racism, but not all people, not all different groups of people have the same thing that, that Jewish people go through with anti-Semitism, which is anti-Semitism isn't just bigotry against Jewish people. It's belief that they control the entire world, right? That's not a thing that is universal in racism. It's a thing that, yeah. you know, it, it exists beyond that, but like, that's a specific thing. Yeah, yeah, with black people, they're never uh, worried we're in charge. They're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty confident yeah. we are not in charge, <laughs> yes, except for LeBron. Exactly. I think they're a little worried LeBron might be in charge, but everybody else, they're like pretty certain we ain't got shit. Whereas yeah, Jewish exactly. people, they're real worried about being yeah. in charge. LeBron is in charge. And I hope so. I, <laughs> I mean, God, that would be comforting. Because um, he's he good at you something. His big, strong arms. That'd be beautiful. <laughs> It would just be nice to know that the person in charge of the world had at least a talent, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got one skill. Maybe he has others. Yeah, we can yeah, teach yeah, him to talk. Yeah. This will be fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure he's not going to bomb anybody. <laughs> God, I, I, if, oh, so comforted what? by that, that future for yeah. us. Yeah. Just, just LeBron James. Running Duncan on government. Netanyahu. It'll, mm -hmm. It was oh, a beautiful, be beautiful. Yeah, the only bombs he drops are, 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 are basketballs. That I, would be nice. Wow, did you just yeah. try to do a sports reference? I mean, I did. I did my best. It was really Sophie. painful for me. I know. I'm sorry. Well, I'm proud um, of you. I think thank you, you showed up. I mean, I'm proud of you for knowing LeBron's last name. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I do live in the world. Um, <laughs> and it, he does run it. So it's one of the things that's hard to miss. Yeah, again, anti-Semitism, like in kind of the modern sense of the word, when we talk academically, a lot of times today, if you're just if you're racist against Jewish people, that's anti-Semitism. And I, it is. But when we talk about it academically, we're talking about not just racism, but the theory that the Jews control everything right like that, that conspiratorial belief that doesn't go back forever. Um, there's again, racism against Jewish people has a long history. You can find Romans like Cicero talking about Jewish gold and Roman poets like juvenile decrying Jews as drunken and misbehaved. But the bigotry on display by these guys, these Romans is the same kind of bigotry they had about everyone who wasn't Roman, right? Like you can find them saying the same shit about Carthaginians and stuff. The ancient Romans burnt down Jerusalem, but they didn't do it because they believed there was a Jewish conspiracy to dominate the world. They were angry that Jewish people didn't worship the emperor and were 
you know, it was it was it was imperial shit. It wasn't like a belief in some sort of conspiracy. <laughs> they burned it down and they said, this isn't personal, fellas. We just this don't. isn't personal. <laughs> this is what we do. We're the Roman Empire. We burned down a lot of cities and that's what we're going to last a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't think this is about your religious yeah. beliefs. This has nothing to do with that. I mean, a little bit, but yeah, <laughs> we don't think you're pulling the strings. We're pulling the strings. We're the Roman Empire. Yeah. Early Christians spent a lot of time vilifying Jewish thinkers. And this is kind of where the roots of anti-Semitism go back. This was due partly to the fact that in the early days of Christianity, most people who and most people weren't Christians just saw it as like a kind of Judaism, right? Like, oh, you've got Christian and Jews are kind of the same thing. Like they like Christian and Jewish people don't see it that way. But like Roman pagans are like, well, they're all they're all the same. They all believe there's just one God, like a bunch of lunatics. <laughs> um, yeah. So. <laughs> Um, Christians, early Christians wanted to differentiate themselves from Jewish people. And one way to do that was by attacking Judaism, an early Christian apologist, which is like a guy, you know, a hype man for Christianity. Like he's, he's they're trying to drum up interest in the religion. Uh, Justin was maybe the first Christian to claim that Jewish people had, quote, killed the Christ. And Justin is the origin of the like the Jews killed Jesus thing, right? That Mel Gibson yeah. put in his movie and stuff. Yeah. I love yeah. that his name is Justin. That's great. Yeah. That's just another Justin <laughs> fucking shit up for everybody. Yeah. The first Justin really showed up. Justin just, the martyr. Yeah. Just was a piece of shit right off Thanks, the jump. Thanks, Justin. Love it. God. <laughs> At least it wasn't a chet. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got our own uh, chat and uh he's one of a yeah. kind just <laughs> yeah we we sure do <laughs> justin was followed in sort of weaving the 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 bones of anti-semitism by a guy called tertullian who was one of the fathers of the christian church tertullian called synagogues fountains of persecution now these stereotypes as jewish people as rebels who rejected jesus and persecuted christians Evolved over the decades and centuries as Christianity went from kind of a fringe cult to the dominant religion of the Western world. And these this bigotry shaped the attitudes of a lot of medieval Christian communities to, towards the Jewish diaspora. There were pogroms and massacres inspired by these beliefs. In 1190, at least 150 Jewish people were massacred in the town of York. In 1290, Jews were expulsed en masse from England in an act of ethnic cleansing, one that was followed by France in 1306 and Spain in 1492. In 1543, Martin Luther called the church in Rome the Devil's Synagogue and derided Catholic Whoa. orthodoxy as Jewish in his greed. We don't talk enough about how racist Martin Luther was. He was like, was Catholics are so Jewish, <laughs> these Jewish Catholics. <laughs> they only talk about how nice that dude was. And he, yeah, was, no. whoa. he was a piece of shit, massive piece of shit. <laughs> Wrote a whole book about how he didn't like Jewish people. Listen, Real bad guy. <laughs> I never tr I never trusted his haircut. So for yeah. me, it was a no from the start. But I've, I've only heard good news. And this is bad news on the whole this Martin Luther bad front. bad news. You're going to hear bad news about a couple of people in this. It's was we again, the Holocaust really changed a lot of this because after the Holocaust, people started feeling some shame for saying bigoted things about Jewish people in public. Um, but man, everybody was racist against Jewish people <laughs> right up until that moment, right? There's these, there were a couple of big myths in Christendom. One of them was the idea of like the blood Passover is how it's referred to, which is that rabbis kidnap Jewish babies and use their blood to make like matzah bread, basically, mm. like to celebrate the Passover. And the other, and you'll see there are churches in Europe today with stained glass reliefs of rabbis killing Christians, like to this day are still Whoa, up in Europe. Like that yeah. they, they refuse to take down or like yeah, they it's don't history even look up or whatever. there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, they, nobody's going to that. these churches, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's one of those things like when it's often framed because of how kind of rapidly society changed after the Holocaust. It's often framed as like the Germans drummed all of this hatred up. No, they didn't. It went back. There were ethnic cleansings in every country in Europe against the Jews in the centuries prior to the Holocaust, you know? Right. It's a, yeah. And the, um, the, uh, yeah. So, and the other big myth is the, the Juden sow, which is like a, a, a pig that is, Jewish babies are suckling at its breasts and you'll see this there are stained glass reliefs of Jewish babies like nursing from pigs in the great old cathedrals of Europe Jesus um, Christ. it's deeply woven into the history of Christianity <laughs> is what I'm saying we don't talk about it <laughs> so what really but again 
this these aren't conspiracy there's conspiracies about like yeah rabbis murdering kids and stuff like that but there's not nobody's talking about jews running the world right there's this mm-hmm. idea these are aliens in our midst they're dangerous because they're different there's not this idea that like there's the secret masters of the universe that really got started after the French Revolution in the 1700s. Um, when the French Revolution hit, conspiracies were immediately woven to lay blame for it on the Jews. A couple of years after the revolution, Edmund Burke published a manifesto on the French Revolution where he declared the revolutionaries Jew brokers and old Jewry. <laughs> now. This is one of history's great ironies because you have seen a quote from Edmund Burke. If you've watched documentaries about the Holocaust, if you've watched documentaries about the Nazis, there's a specific Edmund Burke quote that shows up fucking constantly. I probably saw it a hundred times as a kid. The quote is, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Mm. And that is often used in, in like Holocaust documentaries in the never again sense is that like if only good people had done something, we could have stopped this. And the people who use that quote, I don't think generally know that Edmund Burke helped found modern anti-Semitism. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know that he wasn't including Jews in that. Yeah, good he was list. not. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, listen, good men should do something. Not you Jews. Stay out of it. You're not good people. <laughs> That's the that's the feel you get from Mr. Burke. Um, And yeah, his Burke's attitude towards the French Revolution is very similar to Adolf Hitler's attitude towards the Russian Revolution, because Hitler blamed it on Judeo Bolsheviks. That was always Mm. the term he would use. They're the same. It's the same basic idea, right? This cataclysm has changed Europe forever. This dynasty has been swept from power. It can't just have been because they were shit and they made people angry. It has to be the Jews, you know? Um Obviously, the fact that the idea that Jewish people had been pulling the strings was not the only or even the most prominent conspiracy theory in the wake of the French Revolution. In 1797, a French Jesuit named Abbe Barwell wrote a treatise blaming the revolution on a cabal of Freemasons. Barwell was a reactionary, one of the French aristocrats who opposed the revolution because it, it took his friend's stuff. His argument was nonsense, since many of the nobles who had been massacred in the French Revolution had been Freemasons themselves. It was not like a poor dude thing. Uh, <laughs> but there were a lot of conspiracies about the Masons. Um, and Barwell did not initially blame Jewish people for the revolution. He just thought the Freemasons did it. But he's got this conspiracy theory out that the Freemasons were behind it. Guys like Burke are, say, claim, are blaming it on Jewish people. And both of these conspiracy theories start circulating at the same time, which meant the two were bound to cross-pollinate. Mm. Now, it's worth noting that throughout this period, Jewish communities lived very much on the margins of most European communities. They were legally second or even third class citizens in most countries. As historian Richard Levy writes, quote, Jews living in European lands and in those parts of the world where Europeans settled had gradually become a pariah people, the embodiment of evil instincts, a false religion, and inferior physical traits. Until the late 18th century, with few exceptions, they lived apart, wrapped in their own self-sufficient religious culture, subject to severe legal disabilities, special taxes, occasional expulsion, and outbursts of popular fury. Although much on the minds of other peoples, Jews were left for the, to themselves for long periods. Their only connection to the larger societies in which they lived was in the economic sphere, where a few amassed legendary fortunes while the great majority pursued marginal, obnoxious occupations, such as money lending, peddling, rent collecting, and tavern keeping. There was segregation against Jewish people in a lot of Europe. You couldn't do certain jobs. You weren't allowed in public. You couldn't join the army. You couldn't do all of the things that Christians could do. One of the few things Jewish people were allowed to do was lend money, which is where like this the idea of the Jewish banker comes mm. from is that and this is the same thing in Islamic societies. You're not allowed to charge interest if you're like an Islamic banker. So in both Christ- Christendom and, and the Muslim world, a lot of banking is done by Jewish people because that's all they're allowed to do. Like, you haven't given us any other option. What the fuck else are we supposed to do? You know? Right. Um, you took that, away every other job. Here we yeah. are. And then you yeah. uh, made fun of us for it and built mm-hmm. a, a big old conspiracy, <laughs> conspiracy theory, theory around, around that. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't win with, you know, racism. Um, tale as old as time. Um <laughs> So as the modern world came into building, being, and secularism went vogue among intellectuals, some of the prescriptions against Jewish people started to fade. Christianity stop, stops being like dominant in government, and a lot of reasonable people are like, well, why are we restricting Jewish people if we're not 
we don't govern based on Christianity. We shouldn't oppress these people just for being Jewish. And so campaigns for emancipation started to pick up in the 17 and 1800s. And these are these are campaigns by Jewish people and their allies Mm -hmm. for equal rights under the law. A lot of this was driven by the French Revolution, because in the French Revolution, after the king was overthrown, Jewish people gained on paper, at least equal rights. It didn't really work out that way, as it never does with emancipation campaigns. But things got a lot better for them. And this is part of why guys like Edwin, Edmund Burke were so certain that Jews were behind the whole thing, right? There's a revolution. A lot of prescriptions and, and, and laws against Jewish people doing stuff are repealed. Of course, it must have been them that orchestrated it because they benefited, right? <laughs> That's a key aspect of conspiracism. You see a group that benefits, you assume they caused the thing. Um, it's the way human brains work, I guess. In 1789, when the National Assembly of France approved the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, one prominent French representative called upon his fellow citizens to acknowledge Jews as free French citizens. He argued that they were due everything any other citizen was due, which sounds great, but then he went on to say this, Jews should be given everything as individuals and nothing as a nation. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I like a few of these guys. Yeah, I just don't like them as a group. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm fine with Jewish people as individuals. We're all humans. Their religion is bad, and they need to give it up to integrate into society. That's oh, what boy. he's saying, right? Like, you need yeah. as long as you assimilate, then you get equal rights. If you continue to be Jewish, then I'm not cool with you. And this was very common among, like, I guess what you'd call the woke left at the time, that, like, we shouldn't restrict Jewish people from doing anything, but they should stop being Jewish. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a common idea. Give it up. Just come yeah, over here. Just be come like over us. Here. We be like you. us. We love you if you do everything we do and never argue with us. Yeah. Again, a story that has never been repeated in history. Oh. Um, so a major move towards mass emancipation of U- European Jews came courtesy of a guy you might not suspect, Napoleon Bonaparte. He's wow. actually a huge figure in Jewish emancipation. In the early days of his empire, he was one of the things that made him noteworthy is he welcomed Jewish men into his army as soldiers, which was not done in a lot of Europe. He was like, because and this he wasn't doing this because he was particularly woke or a good person. He was doing this because like, you're a body's a body. Yeah. I need people to die for me. You, you guys die just as can, do, do Jewish people respond the same to getting shot as white. Bring them in. Yeah. You Jewish dude, stand in front of me. Yeah, I, stand in front of me. I've got a good feeling about you. I, I don't care what you believe as long as you hold a gun for me. You know, that's that's Napoleon's attitude. Um, and again, he's not doing this because he's a nice man, but it has really positive impacts on a lot of Jewish communities in Europe because Napoleon conquers fucking everything. When his armies conquered the city of Padua in Italy, they knocked down the walls of that city's ghetto, basically to say that like this, you, your restrictions, like you, your your life as second class citizens is over. We're destroying the wall that separates you from the rest of society, which is mm. a huge moment for Italian Jews, right? Like Italian Jewish people who had been oppressed for centuries see French Jews carrying guns giving orders and liberating them from bondage. It's a big fucking moment. And a messianic fervor begins to sweep through Europe, which is this idea, you know, Jewish people are, are still waiting for the Messiah, right? Like that's this, he's that he's going to come, he's going to come. A lot of them become convinced in this period that Napoleon's coming was a sign that the Messiah is about to come. Napoleon was sent by God to liberate us. And our, our time of our time of struggle and trial is almost over. You oh know? boy, they uh, they weren't <laughs> they were a little off on that one. <laughs> L- little bit off on that one. Yeah. This really feels like uh, when Suge Knight went to the Source Awards and told everybody to come to Death Row. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. yeah, he's he's yes, offering a, yes. an alternative option, but it's not going to mm-hmm. be good for anybody. You know, a lot of a lot of Italian Jewish historians compare Suge Knight to, <laughs> to the siege of Padua. It's it's an extremely common. <laughs> uh, like Suge Knight, Napoleon was shot twice at the VMAs. Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> like Suge Knight, Napoleon ran a dude over with his car and then backed over the guy again. <laughs> that Classic he did comparisons. <laughs> You know who else is a lot like Suge Knight? Robert. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> We're supported by Suge Knight, this podcast, right? He, he backs us, doesn't he? <laughs> he backs us. He, he goes forward. He backs us again. Is he that what you're getting again. at? Is there that you what go. you're getting at? Uh, there it is. 
We're back. Uh, we're back, and we're just appreciating Suge Knight and Napoleon. <laughs> two, two dudes just racking up the W's at this point. <laughs> <laughs> both of them have a fall from grace, right? Sure. <laughs> Napoleon and Suge both end up in prison. <laughs> I stand behind my comparison. I think they yeah, both... Yeah, no, it is a good one. <laughs> they both did uh, really well and then mm-hmm. not well at all immediately after. If you could bridge the language be- gap between them, I actually do think they would probably have gotten along. Oh, they divide. They, they all, divide. All, all empire builders are the same kind of dude, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Jewish people, as a result of Napoleon's kind of libera- liberatory rhetoric and the fact that, like, he really does improve things for Jewish people in his empire, start to feel like the, mes- the messianic period is here. We're about to be freed. And for a few years, you can see why they felt that way. Between 1808 and 1815, Napoleon's conquest of Warsaw led to a mass liberation of Polish Jews, who overnight received full civil rights for the first time in their history. There were even whispers during the Egyptian campaign that Napoleon meant to reconquer the Holy Land for diaspora Jews and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Napoleon went, meant nothing of the sort. He was <laughs> never going, get Napoleon, give land to people? Yep. <laughs> yeah. You you have misunderstood Napoleon, <laughs> sir. <Yeah. laughs> but he recognized the propaganda value in what he was doing, especially since there's Jewish communities all throughout Europe and the countries he's going to war with. If I can get these people on my side, if I can get them to think I'm going to liberate them, Maybe they will back me when I fight their governments. You know, it's this it's this this is it's a smart thing to do if you're a guy like Napoleon. It's the thing the British Empire does all throughout the areas they control is you find these different groups, these like marginalized groups in the countries that you're trying to conquer and you support them against the people they have you know an issue with. And it, that's a good that's a, if you're a conqueror coming in, it's a smart thing to do. Well, it's the, the sad yeah. part is uh, governments are never nice to everyone. And mm-hmm. so subsequently, some dude coming in looking to take over is going to find some folks that are pretty unhappy with the way things have been going this entire time. Yes, exactly. So Napoleon, in reality, was, number one, pretty racist against Jewish people. He was just better than the king had been. Um, and he didn't he didn't he was like these guys we were talking about, the, these early French revolutionaries. He he thought Jewish people had equal rights. He didn't think they had the right to to be Jewish. Um, he wanted them to join secular French culture. He actually called a meeting of this like Jewish religious Congress, the Sanhedrin, that hadn't met in centuries. And they think that he's calling the meeting to be like, you know, it's time, you know, the messianic periods here. Like, I'm going to liberate like your homeland for you and take you back. That's what they think is happening. Napoleon is basically going to force all these Jewish representatives to vote that they're loyal Frenchmen who will fight for him. You know, that's what he wants to do is he wants to get the he wants to. Like he's he's running a show vote to like get all of these people on his side Uh, and his in reality, a lot of what he did for Jewish people was really shitty. One of the things he did was he canceled all debts owed by Christians to Jews, and he didn't only do that. But he legally punished all Jewish people in the French Empire by burdening them with a communal debt to Christians that they had to repay. Basically, it's wrong that you were doing the only job we let you do and you owe all Christians money in order to pay back like the the the, like the the loans and stuff that you like. It's 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 bad. He's he's a piece. I mean, he's Napoleon. So he he canceled Christian debt and then put that debt on Jewish people. Yeah, basically. Yes. Jesus. He's he's I mean, he's Napoleon. He wasn't a good guy, (laughs) you know, Um, and what was more fucked up, the really the most toxic aspect of this, because even with that and even with that taken into account, life got a lot better for Jewish people under Napoleon. Um, What was most fucked up about what Napoleon did was the way that his enemies reacted to his supposed pro Jewish leanings. See, Napoleon went to war with basically everybody. The rulers of Europe knew that all of these Jewish communities in their countries were talking about how the Messiah was nigh and Napoleon had been sent to free them. And they responded with a propaganda blitz that tied the dreaded Napoleon to the untrustworthy Jews, trying to tear down the old order of Europe for their own nefarious ends. 
One of these propagandists was Abbe Barowell, who'd initially blamed the French Revolution on Freemasons. But in 1806, he started circulating a forged letter, probably sent to him by members of the state police, who resented Napoleon's liberal attitude towards the Jews. The Jewish Virtual Library writes that this letter, quote, called attention to the alleged part of the Jews in the conspiracy that he had earlier attributed to the Masons. This myth of an international Jew- Jewish conspiracy reappeared later on in 19th century Europe in places such as Germany and Poland. So this is where this this is where this myth starts, right? Is this guy who had first blamed the revolution on the the Freemasons he sees Napoleon doing some nice stuff for Jewish people. He loops them into that conspiracy. The Jews and the Freemasons overthrew the King of France, and now mm. they're trying to destroy the order in Europe. That's how this evolves. Now, the group in Europe who most dove into this new conspiracy theory were the Tsars of Russia. Their empire had a massive, downtrodden Jewish population. Um, there there had been massive genocides in both Poland and Russia against the Jews for, for centuries at this point, including one, the Kelmnitz massacre in eastern Poland that killed like three quarters of a million people. Um, Just like really, really bad stuff. So obviously the czars have reason to be worried that these people aren't loyal. Because they've been <laughs> killing them. You know? <laughs> hey, you think they remember what we did? Yeah. Uh, they oh, probably shit. remember, right? <laughs> And they're worried because Napoleon's coming for them, or they think, it, I mean, he did eventually, but they th- think at the time he's coming for them, right? He's been beating his way through the Germans, which were kind of our bulwark against France, and he's going to be in our territory soon enough. In 1806, they launch an unprecedented propaganda blitz that would somewhat inadvertently create the basic ideas of modern anti-Semitism. The whole effort represented a massive propaganda reversal for Russia, who needed both to justify an alliance with their ancestral enemies, Prussia, and also introduce a new enemy, the alien evil lurking within, preparing to tear the country down. The culmination of this work was a mass-produced propaganda pamphlet called The Appeal, and I'm going to quote now from an essay written by Johannan Petrovsky Stern, quote, The document climaxes with the entry of the Jews and the expansion of the Jewish theme. Outwitted by a cunning Napoleon and disappointed by only partial emancipation, the gullible Jews of Napoleonic France are portrayed as perfidious accomplices of France and true friends of Bonaparte, a Satan who insolently revolted against the Holy of Holies, the embodiment of absolute evil. Napoleon Bonaparte convened the Jewish synagogues in France, demanding an insulting public homage to the rabbis. He established a new Jewish Sanhedrin, which the Russian document saw as the same godless institution which in its time conspicuously condemned our, condemned our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ to the cross. Napoleon maintained the appeal attend, intended to unify the Jews, whom divine rage dispersed throughout the land, and most importantly, to proclaim Napoleon a false messiah. And the Jews, those alleged haters of Christ, were more than eager to assist Napoleon in his infamy. So the <sighs> real focus of this propaganda is still on Napoleon, but it's sure. tying... This is like the, the the first real document that throws all of this together, all this stuff that becomes modern anti-Semitism. It's it's so strange that uh, they're both uh, he's both calling them uh, idiots and like these sort of like powerful figures in this whole thing. He's like, yeah, they're big, dumb idiots, but we got to yeah. watch out for them because they're super dangerous. <laughs> I mean, it's this thing, it's particular in anti-Semitism, but you see it always in conspiracies. The enemy is simultaneously all powerful and incompetent, you know, Mm -hmm. like it's dumb enough that like you're able like he doesn't like they can't stop us. They can't stop us from what we're doing, but also like they control everything. It's the thing you see. You know, I I keep going back to Alex Jones, but he's a good modern example. Um, It's it's the thing with like QAnon where the conspiracy is is worldwide, but also everyone is 10 steps behind Donald Trump, the perfect genius. You know, Joe Biden can't uh, read, but he also is uh, somehow running this cabal and uh, and taking down their great savior. Yeah, it's it's it never makes much (laughs) sense is the point. Great savior. The czars wrote this appeal, um, but it didn't stay like the, the the official propaganda line for long, because right after it gets published, Napoleon signs a peace treaty with Russia. The czars backpedal and they issue a, like a new pro-France po- propaganda campaign to try to get everyone on board with the fact that now we're friendly with France. And obviously this, this doesn't last. They eventually go to war. But the government abandons this anti-Semitic line of attack almost as soon as they began it. 
but the appeal made a terrible impact during its brief period of circulation. Russia had always been a land of pogroms, and distrust of Jewish communities ran deep. The appeal had provided a justification for violence and confiscation of Jewish property. It was an act of self-defense against an embedded alien enemy. So the appeal gives all these people who had always been violent to Jews a justification for why they're defending themselves by carrying out these pogroms. Mm. Independent newspapers started printing their own follow-ups to the appeal, imitating its key motif, the idea of a vast Jewish conspiracy against the Russian people. For the first quarter of the 19th century, Russian literature increasingly depicted Jews differently from European literature. Russian literary scholar Mikhail Weisskopf writes, Already in the 1820s, it becomes visible in Russian prose and the idea of a secret Jewish government, which together with other evil powers, is participating in a plot against all humanity. It's almost like the appeal is a virus, right? And once it gets out, it starts to spread throughout Russia, throughout like the Russian intellectual community. And it becomes by the 1820s, it's all throughout their fiction. It's all throughout their literature. This idea of a vast Jewish conspiracy, it, it's broken containment. You know, it's mm-hmm. not in control of the czars anymore. Um, and it, it doesn't stay trapped in Russia. We see variants arising throughout the rest of Europe in the mid 1820s. A good example of a uh, of of kind of one variant of this that's li- it's different from what's happening in Russia, but it has similar roots is the kind of anti-Semitism that you saw expressed by Karl Marx. Despite having Jewish ancestry himself, Marx's early career involved some pretty rough claims. This is his early career, but there's some bad stuff in here. In 1843, he blamed the existence of modern capitalism on the Judaizing or Judaizing. The, the Jew, you know, uh, on on Christian society being made more Jewish, right? Oh, Capitalism Carl, comes from the Jews. Don't. Carl, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you 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 always a reference. That's a good guy. Why, Carl? He was right about a lot. <laughs> Not this. Um, he was wrong about stuff too. He, he wrote a lot. You know, we were um, all rooting for you, Carl. That's that's disappointing. Yeah, I, oh. it's the it, it's so common though. It's the same thing if you look at like a lot of the founding intellectual minds of modern anarchism. Uh, guys like Kropotkin and and Prudhon, super anti-Semitic, really, mm-hmm. really racist. Like, cause just because everyone, it was very like all of Christendom was really bigoted against Jewish people. It was extremely common. It seems like it's like the one thing that can kind of bring everybody together at this point. It's just like, well, we all hate Jews, right? That's why the Nazis pick it. You know, it, you you find the common enemy and you rally everyone around them, even though the enemy is actually has no power and isn't responsible for any of your problems. It just is. It's what works. Um, and again, with Marx, we see because kind of this Russian propaganda hasn't reached to England yet where he's writing. Marx is more in kind of line with these those old French revolutionaries. He doesn't hate Jewish people. He doesn't like the Jewish religion, right? He thinks that in his ideal society, Jewish people will emancipate themselves by giving up Judaism, right? Um, and he's not a fan of like Christianity in particular either, but he believes that Jewish people are like their 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 religion is capitalist, so they mm. have to give it up in order to like become part of the rest of the world. In 1844, Marx wrote an essay with the deeply unfortunate title. On the Jewish question, he's not the only one using this phrase. <laughs> like that's why Hitler uses it, right? It is called that by a lot of people. And the Jewish question is, what do we do with Jewish people? And of, of course, the answer is never listen. Just, just let them, just let them do their thing. Just, yeah. just, 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 just <laughs> yeah, chill the fuck out. Awesome. Yeah, they, just, they seem uh, fine. Let's yeah. invite them over and have a nice brunch. <laughs> yeah, <Nice and> cool. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe stop being shitty to them. But no, that's never the answer. Uh, in this pamphlet, he described the Jewish religion as huckstering and the Jewish God as money. He concluded that in the final analysis, the emancipation of the Jews is the emancipation of mankind from Judaism. And again, this sounds exterminationist. He's not saying that he's saying the emancip- mankind will be emancipated when they give up their religion. Right. We want the people. We don't want their faith, which isn't good, but it's different from like the Nazi arguments that you're going to hear later. This is kind of the standard liberal line at this point in time in history. And yeah, it, it's interesting. You'll see people declare Marx anti-Semitic over this. And Marx was, again, had Jewish ancestry. But one of the people who will disagree with the claim that Marx is anti-Semitic is Jonathan Sachs, chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. And Mm. Sachs's argument is simple. The word anti-Semitism didn't exist when Marx wrote his essay. And the bigotry he expressed in that essay was against a religion. It did not have a racial component, and he did not believe in a conspiracy of Jewish people. Marx was bigoted against the Jewish faith, but he didn't see there being he didn't think Jewish people were inherently involved in a plot. 
the building strains of Russian anti-Semitism hadn't crossed over into the West yet. And so the utterly commonplace bigotry against Judaism that Marx expressed hadn't been cross-pollinated with conspiracism yet. That process wouldn't really get underway until the late 1800s. The actual word anti-Semitism was popularized by a German journalist named Wilhelm Marr in 1879. Now, Marr was an anti-Semite. He's the guy who came up with the word, you know, like you're high on the list. (laughs) He wasn't pointing it out in someone else. He was like, no, this is what I am. This is we got to have I'm... a word for the shitty stuff, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you're as awesome as me, you need a title. You, you got to put need a title, a title. On it. <laughs> So Marr coined the term in an unhinged screed, he wrote, titled The Victory of Jewry Over Germandom. That was about what you'd expect it to be about. And it has some real Nazi strains in it. You know, mm-hmm. you can draw a direct, direct line from Marr to the death camps. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting about Marr's bigotry and about the idea of anti-Semitism that he crafts is that his hatred of Jewish people was not based in Christianity because he was secular. Right. He didn't he didn't hate Jewish people because he thought they were responsible for killing Jesus. He rejected myths about the ritual murder of Christian babies by rabbis. Instead, according to an article in The Conversation, quote, He drew on the fashionable theories of the French academic Ernst Renan, who viewed history as a world-shaping contest between Jewish Semites and Aryan Indo-Europeans. Marr suggested that the Jewish threat to Germany was racial. He said that it was born of their immutable and destructive nature, their tribal (laughs) peculiarities and alien essence. Yeah. Alien essence. Oh, man. He was like, listen, I'm not falling for any of that previous propaganda. I know they're not suckling at pigs. I know they're not. Their religion is fine. I don't like them at their core. Their essence is what's broken in them. You don't understand. Let me tell you where the other racists fall short. <laughs> you guys are so focused on the book. Forget the book. Yeah. It's in their it's in their spirit. It, it's in their blood. Yeah. <laughs> no, that like he's he really is a terrible man. Um, and one of the things that's so dangerous about guys like Mar, guys like Renan, is that their bigotry isn't based in like provincial like religious stuff they're not like a bunch of old hillbillies who are superstitious against the jews they're intellectuals they're secular and their hatred of jewish people their anti-semitism is gets is intellectually respectable they get articles published in journals scholars have to debate their racism and that's a big step forward this isn't you know because it's the world secularizing we're leaving the old bigotries in the past and mar finds a way to be like we don't have to leave this in the past. I've modernized it. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. This iPhone got an update. and uh... This iPhone got an update. Yeah. <laughs> no planned obsolescence for racism. Now, one thing we've seen throughout the last couple of decades of history that we've been covering today is that all of the stages of this growth in anti-Jewish sentiment were a reaction to emancipation, right? Which, again, we see this throughout history. This oppressed, marginalized group starts to get equal rights. They don't even get them. They start to get them. They start to agitate for them. And people who are oppressing them freak the fuck out that this is a plot against the oppressors. In Russia's case, it was a panic that Jewish communities might back Napoleon in a coming war. Marx's essay on the Jewish question was a reaction to the growing emancipation movements across Europe. Renan and Marr were both trying to stop Jewish integration into Christian civilization. This happened throughout the Christian world, as Richard Levy wrote writes, quote, only after Jews had begun to emerge from their isolation did anti-Semitism begin to surface in Europe. Instead of episodic repression and violence, followed by decades of calm, anti-Semites endeavored to make persecution of the Jews permanent. Convinced that Jews had already gathered enormous power and that, as one pamphlet of the time put it, the victory of Jewry was imminent, anti-Semites mm. determined that constant struggle against the enemy was an absolute necessity for the survival of Christian civilization. They founded political parties, voluntary associations, newspapers, and periodicals to this end. In the last quarter of the 19th century, the word anti-Semitism expressed a new way of dealing with the problem of the Jews. So in the olden days, the medieval period, right, when Christianity dominates everything, it's enough to just be racist against the Jews. It's enough to just be bigoted. It's enough to just to share myths about them eating babies. When the world modernizes and Jewish people start to integrate with society, that's where bigotry isn't enough because bigotry isn't modern. What you need is a theory that there's a war. We're engaged in a battle with the Jews. Mm. They're trying to take over our society. These these campaigns for equal rights, they're fighting to oppress us. And that's 
that's modern, you know, like sure. you can you can have that in a scientific industrial society. They're managing the hate just fine. We have to exactly. uh, create some sort of like hidden extra yeah. layer to this yeah. bad boy. Exactly. Exactly. And while Marx is proof that there was a lot of anti-Jewish bigotry on the left, the vast majority of the growing anti-Semitic movement was conservative in nature. This was due in part to the fact that as Jews gained political rights, most of them wound up as liberals or socialists because those were the movements most effectively fighting for the emancipation of all people. You know, like it, a lot of a lot of Jewish political activists in this period, because they're oppressed, understand the oppression of other groups and fight to liberate them and fight not just like racial groups, but like liberate the poor and stuff. Um, <laughs> and the reactionary right sees this and they fold anti-Semitism into their propaganda against socialists. And this brings us once again to czarist Russia. The late 1800s were also a period of increasing left-wing resistance to the czarist dictatorship. The People's Will, a left-wing political organization we might call accelerationist terrorists, although I think they were rad, embarked on a campaign of direct violence aimed at destroying the czarist regime. This culminated with their successful assassination by bomb of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. They just blew him up. They threw a bomb at his carriage. And exploded him. Yeah. Whoa. Was it's he some alone? intense shit. <laughs> no, he had guys with him. They fuck up a lot of people. Oh. Like it's it's a big old thing, you know? <laughs> and there were there had been a huh. Do you know who else would what? be very into that? You know who else would assassinate the Tsar of Russia? Our sponsor, Raytheon? Yeah, I mean <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes they would, so yeah. yes they would. That- yeah. <laughs> If there's one sponsor of ours that's good at assassinating czars, it's Raytheon. <laughs> you could really draw a, de- a direct line. The people's will is just a precursor of Raytheon. They couldn't shoot knives out of the sky from drones, so mm. a guy had to throw a big comical spherical bomb in a carriage. <laughs> but it's in Raytheon's DNA. You sure. know, that's why their motto is, Raytheon, fuck the czar. <laughs> Here's products. All right. So a bunch of Russian revolutionaries in this period, a lot of the people who were trying to overthrow the czar were Jewish men and women. Now, this was both because a lot of Jewish people were heavily represented in socialist movements at this period, and also because the czars had massacred Jewish people for centuries. You know, Mm -hmm. it makes sense. Again, I'm I'm thoroughly on the pro murdering the czar side of things in case people are curious. (laughs) They are terrorists. This is terrorism. They're just justified. You know, if you live under a czar. It's fine. To These do are that, cool I terrorists. These are, I'm, I'm down with it. Right. These terrorists I'm down with are the turning will. their yeah. their their chair <laughs> backwards to, to uh-huh. throw their bombs. You know what yeah. I mean? AC Slater yeah. style. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, the waves of anarchist and socialist terrorist attacks and a lot of these terrorists in this period in Russia are anarchists. Right. This is idea from Bakunin of propaganda of the deed. The best propaganda is like killing the fucking czar. Like we don't want a czar. What is the best way we can tell people we don't want a czar? What if we kill him? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, um, and I think the people's will was kind of more of just like a, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I don't think, it, I don't know if it would be right to call them anarchists, definitely left wing and, and socialisty. Um, but they killed the czar and this freaks the fuck out of the government, right? So there's, as you would expect in the wake of the head of state being killed, this massive wave of, repre- of repression, not just against the actual group that had killed the czar, but against anyone doing socialist organizing in Russia. And there is this kind of unhinged panic among Russian conservatives that there's a, that there's a conspiracy not just to kill the czar, but to overthrow the government, which there is, but they convince themselves not that This is happening because we're terrible at ruling Russia and we've oppressed people horrifically and they have good reason to want to overthrow the government. They're convinced it's the Jews, right? (laughs) Because this propaganda started circulating in 1806, right? This has been going on for a while, this idea that there's a conspiracy to destroy our government and it's the Jews behind it. Now, for some context, this is a bloody period in Russian history, not compared to modern Russian history. But compared to, I don't know, most places, about 17,000 people are killed or wounded in terrorist attacks in the last 20 years of the Russian Empire. Whoa. So there is a lot of violence. Yeah. yeah. Um, like some bad shit going on. Uh, and it was a time of tremendous upheaval and rapid change. 
Tsar Al- Alexander II, before his death, had freed the serfs, right? So, like, Russia is industrializing rapidly. They end serfdom. There's a lot of political changes. There's also all this terrorism and violence. There's these military defeats in Crimea and again against Japan. And as we discussed at the top of the episode, when things are changing rapidly, when people, particularly conservatives, feel like they don't have any solid ground beneath their feet, that's the kind of situation in which conspiracism really breeds most effectively because you need something to explain it. You don't want to think that like, well, all of these economic and social forces have come together to cause rapid change and unrest and we need to adapt to it. No, no, no. There's an evil cabal responsible for everything I don't understand. And if we can kill them, we'll solve all of our problems. Sure. It's it's hard to believe that uh, the world just played out the way that it played out and you got fucked. So it's yeah. easier to like blame a specific party for you getting fucked. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a story as well, at least a couple hundred years old. And this brings me finally to the protocols of the elders of Zion. We had a long prologue this episode. I love it. So <laughs> most people who write about the protocols and we'll talk about exactly what they say in a little bit. Most people who write about them will authoritatively state that they were created initially by the Okhrana, which was the czarist secret police. This The Okhrana are like they're the precursor to the Gestapo and the KGB, even like the FBI and the CIA, you could argue. They're one of the very first like secret services. And their whole job is to keep the czar in power, right? They infiltrate. We're supposed to infiltrate left wing movements. We're supposed to stop assassination attempts. We're supposed to stop people from changing the order. So I will say everyone says you know, you, any article you read is going to say like the Okrana created the protocols of the elders of Zion. They probably did. But there's zero conclusive evidence that they did. Historians who know this shit heavily debate the origin of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. We do not have a comprehensive, utterly proven example for like why they were made in the first place, right? There's a chain of custody. You can tell kind of like how they evolved over time. We don't know at whose order they were crafted or if they were anyone's order. That's just not. That's not clear. I'll attach an article by a great historian who kind of breaks down why, because there's a famous comic book about the protocols of the elders of Zion by a great Jewish um, Stanley Siegel. I think it was um, a great Jewish uh, comic book artist, and it's a good comic. It gets a lot of historical details about the people who we know were involved in the creation of the protocols wrong, because there's a lot of myths about them. Again, the protocols are a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories arise to explain how they came into being. There's a lot of disinformation out there. That said, broadly speaking, the Okrana are the most likely culprit for the creation of the protocols of the elders of Zion. If they didn't make it or order its creation, they certainly had a major hand in its early distribution. But before we talk about how the protocols spread, I should explain precisely what they are. In short, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion are a fake document that purports to be the minutes of a meeting of the gro- a global Jewish conspiracy to destroy Christianity. It's con- <laughs> yeah, right? Like, it's th- like we had this meeting to talk about our evil yeah. world domination schemes, and we wrote it down in case, like, you might not have been able to make the meeting. We got to get sure. this memo to you, you know? Yeah. Read back the minutes for me real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yep. I, I want the mi- minutes of our plan to destroy civilization. Yes. <laughs> Very funny that you would think it works that way. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how this is framed. I am, and it's kind of, the document is written not just as minutes, but as like kind of, oh, you missed the meeting, but you're a part of this organization. This will get you up to speed on mm-hmm. our plan to destroy Christianity. You know, <laughs> like it's, some, so like you were on vacation the week we had the global conspiracy Quick conference. Cliff notes Take a look at this. Any, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anybody who missed the reading, it's all available yeah. here. Yeah, you fell asleep during the meeting. We get it. It goes on a while. Here's the minutes. It you won't know? be good enough for a book report, but you'll yeah. at least be caught up. You you you'll can get find the bones. Your, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you can find the quote separately, but everything yeah. else is in there. It's very funny. Um, it's not funny. Millions die, um, <laughs> but it's 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 patently ridiculous, right? Any reasonable person would be like, of course, if there's a grand world conspiracy, they don't just have a document that says, "Here's what we're doing." Mm-hmm. But this is a lot we talk about in our Bill Cooper episode. A bunch of Bill Cooper's conspiracy theories were based on leaked military documents talking about their plans to destroy the world, like as if that would get written down, right? Um. Anyway. Uh, I'm not going to read huge excerpts from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion for obvious reasons, but it's necessary to read some pieces of it so you can understand how the arguments in it were framed. Here's how it opens according to a 1970 edition of the Protocols based on an early 20th century British translation. Quote, protocol, this is from protocol number one. There's like a bunch of them. 
Right lies in might, freedom, an idea only, liberalism, gold, faith, self-government, despotism of capital, the internal foe, the mob, anarchy, politics versus morals, the right of the strong, the invincibility of Jew Masonic authority, in justifies means, the mob a blind man, political ABC, party discord, <laughs> most satisfactory f- uh, form of rule, despotism, alcohol, classicism, corruption, principles and rules of the Jewish Masonic government, terror, liberty, equality, and fraternity, principle of dynastic rule, annihilation of the privileges of the Goy aristocracy, i.e. non-Jew, as if they need to write that in there, right? Like, you've got, like, like uh, I should remind you that the words that we use. Um, putting aside fine phrases, we shall speak of the sur- significance of each thought. By comparisons and deductions, we shall throw light upon surrounding facts. What I am about to set forth, then, is our system from the two points of view, that of ourselves and that of the Goyim, i.e., non-Jews. They keep putting that in there. I, I, was, in my, yeah. I was hoping that they were going to end that list by going, yeah. we didn't start the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that bad boy roll. That'd that, be fun. That might be a cover of Billy Joel we don't need. <laughs> Um, it must be noted that men with bad instincts are in more number than the good, and therefore the best results in governing them fr- uh, fr- them are attained by violence and terrorization, not by academic discussions. Every man aims at power. Everyone would like to become a dictator, if only he could, and rare indeed are the men who would not be willing to sacrifice the welfare of all for the sake of securing their own welfare. What has restrained the beasts of prey, the beasts of prey who are called men? What has served their guidance hitherto? In the beginning of the structure of society, they were subjected to brutal and blind force afterwards to law which is the same force only disguised i draw the conclusion that by the law of nature right lies in force so the author of the document who is a rabbi standing in for the whole jewish conspiracy argues that because people are dumb and evil they should be ruled and of course they should be ruled by the jews the rest of the document goes on to propose ways to do this it claims that for centuries the white world was governed by the a mix of the church and monarchs and as long as the church and monarchs were in power the Jewish conspiracy couldn't succeed. I mean, the first half of that was like a Trump tweet, just like keywords. It's nonsense. And they're all yeah. different. There's a bunch of different editions of the protocols. They're all a little bit different. This is the only one I found that has that weird little, yeah, like Trump tweets at the start of it. Yeah. So the fake author of this fake document continues to argue that the Jewish conspiracy, in order to get off the ground, had to destroy faith and religion. So secularism and socialism were invented by Jews to destroy the church because the church was standing in their way of power. After they got rid of the church, they had to overthrow the crowned heads of Europe because the kings are the last protection people had from the conspiracy. The final – and this is, again, this is why it gets drawn into the French Revolution, right? The French Revolution is bad because they got rid of the king. The Jews got rid of the king because it, the king was standing in the way of their, them succeeding. Sure. One of the, the protocols are a really pro-monarchist document, right? Like if we just had kings, everything would be better. <laughs> yeah, I, I think those uh, those bloodlines are the thing that we need to hold closest and cherish yeah. the most. Yeah, we're, yeah. Let's 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 li- line up our 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 city based off of uh, incest babies. Let's do that. Yeah, just some cousins with weird arms. That yeah. that's who we need in charge. There's a conspiracy to destroy <laughs> our freedom, so we have to have kings. <laughs> it's not a. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. Um, so yeah, the first version of the protocols came out around 1896. So they were largely talking about the end of the French monarchy in this, like that, that was the, the initial thing that the protocols are focused around. The monarchs have been overthrown. That's the big problem. And the, the protocols are basically a roadmap purportedly written during this convention, laying out the plan to conquer and govern the world. I'll give a brief summary. Protocol one is to break down the national power of non-Jewish states by fomenting internal revolutions. Appeals to class hatred are key to this, i.e. socialists are doing the work of Jewish people by convincing the poor that the rich are fucking them over, right? Poor people would be happy with their lot in life if it weren't for this conspiracy. Um, (laughs) If only these socialists weren't convincing them that their lives suck. They'd be happy. Mm -hmm. They'd be at peace. They'd be happy. And then our nation would be strong. Uh, these internal revolutions would be fomented by having Jewish agents convince groups of people to agitate for liberty, equality, and fraternity. 
if you remember, liberty, equality, and fraternity are like, that was the motto of the French Revolution. Like, that's what we're fighting for, is we want to all be equal citizens under the law, as opposed to having like a king and a class of nobles who rule over us. And the argument of the protocols is that this is a Jewish conspiracy, because people aren't equal, and liberty is a bad idea. It's just a, it's just a plot in order to, to make our governments weaker so the Jews can take over. Um, again, it's a shitty argument by bad people who think that having a czar is the best thing you could possibly you could possibly have mm. um and the basic idea is that the jews are behind a global campaign for equal rights which are evil uh, autocratic governments are weakened by this first by liberalism then by socialism and finally by anarchy the second protocol was that all law uh, all wars would be shifted to an economic basis ensuring that territorial advantages for one side or the other didn't really happen basically the author of this book took the by then obvious fact that e- economics won wars and used that to claim that the way conflict worked in worked in industrialized society was the fault of the jews because like they 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 control the economy so wars aren't like noble and good anymore. They're just like these uh, these industrial butcheries because of the Jews. Um, next is the strengthening of Jewish international rights, i.e. emancipation, which the author claims comes at the expense of Gentiles because that's the argument racists always make, right? The, the idea is that like part of their conspiracy is agitating for equal rights because if they have equal rights, then Christians have less rights. Like that's <laughs> that's a huge part of this document. And there's other shit, right? There's Which like is out- solid we- math. That's yeah. that, solid that, math. The yeah. math is checking out for me. I'm yeah. I'm over here calculating. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the same argument that powerful groups always make, you know, um, in the face of an oppressed group agitating for more equal rights and there's other shit in there they argue that like alcohol was introduced by jewish people to like numb the minds of christians like race poisons all this nazi Mm. shit it's a lot of nazi shit you know um and it's it's very basic today there's a million conspiracies not all of which are on their surface anti-semitic that have this this same basic thing right there's this conspiracy they're they're weakening your minds with television and with popular music and with drugs and alcohol so that you don't notice that you're being controlled by this evil cabal. And most of the people who believe that do believe the cabal is the Jews, but they don't say it anymore usually, right? <laughs> um, now, in the late 1800s, this idea was revolutionary. This is the first conspiracy theory like this, right? It's the father of them all. And the fact that the early 1900s were a period of calamitous wars that led to economic collapse and the fall of several governments, including the czarist monarchy, convinced a lot of people that the protocols had been perfectly accurate. In the years after World War I, a growing core of conspiracists would, would claim, we know the protocols are real because everything they predicted is coming true. I actually found a 1920 edition of the Protocols that argues a remarkable similarity between the Protocols and acts of the Bolshevik government, which it claims is under the control of Jewish leaders. And it's true that there were a lot of Jewish Bolsheviks, but you'll notice the guy who wound up in charge of the USSR was Joseph Stalin, who was not at all Jewish. (laughs) And in fact, J. Stahl's chief rival for power was a Jewish man, Leon Trotsky, who he forced into exile and then assassinated when, uh, like, he had a guy stab him to death with an ice pick in Mexico. Like, oh, yeah, it's a pretty boss story. Ramon Mercator is the name of the guy who killed Trotsky. Yeah. Jesus, that's not a nice assassination at all. That no. I mean, it's Stalin. <laughs> it's Stalin. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And Fair it's enough. Stalin. Stalin, better than, I guess, Hitler when it comes to treating Jewish communities. Not great on treating Jewish community. Like in USSR, a rough deal for Jewish people during Stalin's era, including like near the end of his life, he became convinced that a cabal of Jewish doctors were planning his assassination, which is why he didn't have any when he had his stroke. There was no medical aid because he'd purged all of these doctors because he was afraid of a Jewish conspiracy. Smart. The idea that the Smart. USSR was like Jew is just nonsense. It's completely ahistorical um, and ignores a lot of suffering of Jewish people under Stalin's government. You know, anyway. So I just I just like your low bar. Yeah. You're like better than yeah. Hitler. Like really <laughs> I mean, setting the standards. The, really the sad well. thing is when you're talking about like that particular war, Stalin does look a lot better because he's standing next to Hitler. You yeah. know, <laughs> like he's yeah. a it's he's a real Beyonce next to Michelle. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, I do. Also <laughs> looks better because he was handsome. And I mean, Hitler there's a lot not. of similarities between Beyonce and Stalin. We've all we've all talked about this <laughs> a right. lot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off this train. I'll let <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, I'm like, I'm I'll like, let you dear God, that one Robert. Home. <laughs> uh, you 
know, who, you know who I've noticed a lot of similarities between Stalin and is is Conan O'Brien, um, <laughs> because Stalin, big lover of pranks, huge lover of pranks. Mm. Conan O'Brien, legendary prankster. <laughs> I was just reading. This is completely off topic, but there's this amazing it's a good thing that there's actually nobody named Conan O'Brien. <laughs> what? What do you mean? What Conan, he, Conan I think O'Brien? She's saying he pronounces Conan. It Conan. Oh, whatever. Whatever, whatever. See, see, Langston, Come Robert on. likes to mispronounce very famous people's names and doesn't realize he's doing it and then gets roasted for no it. One, so I'm just going to no do one it knows. for everybody now. <laughs> I think we have to accept that no one knows how... He, 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 he existed so long ago. No one can tell. It's like Latin. We don't know how it was pronounced. It was so far in the past. Mm. <laughs> Conan? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Famed late night show host. Conan Scholars O'Brien. have their theories about how his name was pronounced, but no one knows for certain. Um, anyway, look up Conan's history of, of, of incredible pranks. <laughs> we just pranks. had this conversation. Um, yeah, we he, did, Sophie. And I just said, with, scholars, scholars debate. Is he hanging out <laughs> like with the him? origin, like, like the origin of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Scholars still debate his the pronunciation of his name. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, it's true. He's you probably know it's hanging true. out with your favorite singer, Ariana Grande. <laughs> Sophie, it's pronounced Grande. Oh, oh, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I know you miss these things a lot because you're not keyed into pop culture like I am. Um, all right. So the protocols were written well ahead of the fall of the czarist government, um, but they were written about the fall of another monarchy. And so a lot of the stuff written about the French Revolution sounded like it was talking about the 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 Russian Revolution, right? This book is about how the Jews are going to overthrow kings. They're writing about something that had already happened and blaming it on the Jews. Then there's another revolution that overthrows the Tsar of Russia. And a lot of people see like, oh, this is proof the protocols are true, right? Everything that they've predicted is coming true. Look, like this is the only reason people would want to overthrow the Tsar. Not that he got them into a war that killed 8 million people. Mm. Um, it must <laughs> just be the Jews, not Those the fact that the Jews. Tsar <laughs> tried to invade Germany and got his ass kicked in one of the most epic beatdowns in military history after getting his ass kicked by the Japanese and another one of the most epic beatdowns in military history. It's not that the Tsar had his soldiers fire on crowds of people protesting for bread. It was it was it was the Jews. It was you know? the Jews. No other reason to want the czar out. Anyway, <laughs> not a pro czar podcast. I do apologize. So, uh, yeah. Now, the actual facts of world history did not matter in the least. The people of the early 1900s were living and dying through the greatest war in history, a terrible plague that killed millions right after the war, and the collapse of the largest land empire on Earth. Russia, the Russian Empire is like a seventh of the world's land mass. Like, it's Whoa. fucking huge. Yeah, we, we don't talk like Russia fucking big, 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 <laughs> big country. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, in the 20s, or late teens, early 20s, it's just this massive pile of people murdering each other. The Russian Revolution is horrifically bloody. Um, and it just, the the entire period of time up to, during, and after World War One is just this, this period of violent chaos that hopefully we will never see the like of again, right? Unless it happens next month. <laughs> um, so the fact that all everything was falling apart seemed to be explained by the protocols and millions of people bought into them. Now, the reality is that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion wasn't just a forgery. It was an act of plagiarism. And it wasn't just an act of plagiarism. It was an act of plagiarism of an act of plagiarism. Whoa. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's meta. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read again from the Jewish Virtual Library here. Quote, The direct predecessor of the Protocols can be found in the pamphlet Dialogues in Hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, published by the non-Jewish French satirist Maurice Jolie in 1864. In his Dialogues, which make no mention of the Jews, Jolie attacked the political ambitions of the Emperor Napoleon III using the imagery of a diabolical plot in hell. The dialogues were caught by French authorities soon after their publication, and Jolie was tried and sentenced to prison for his pamphlet. Jolie's dialogues, while intended as a political satire, soon fell into the hands of a German anti-Semite named Hermann Getsch, writing under the name of Sir John Retcliffe. Getch was a postal clerk and a spy for the Prussian secret police. He had been forced to leave the postal work due to his part in forging evidence in the prosecution against the Democratic leader Benedict Waldeck in 1849. Getch adapted Jolie's dialogues into a mythical tale of a Jewish conspiracy as part of a series of novels entitled Biarritz, 
which appeared in 1868, and a chapter called The Jewish Cemetery in Prague in the Council of Representatives of the Twelve Tribes of Israel, he spins the fantasy of a secret centennial rabbinical conference which meets at midnight and whose purpose is to review the past hundred years and make plans for the next century. So this satirist writes a book like throwing shade on fucking Napoleon the third. And like he frames it as a dialogue between these two dead guys, but he's just being um, silly. He's just having, he's just a, being silly. Yeah. 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 He gets sentenced to prison for this. Oh boy. Um, and <laughs> must have been a good a, joke. That's how you must, know it, was it, it probably joke. was a pretty good joke. Right. <laughs> And a German secret policeman finds his dialogue and writes it into an anti-Semitic novel about a Jewish conspiracy because he thinks that like the wording of the dialogue, which this guy had meant to be about like how the king of France is power hungry. He makes it about how the Jews are are trying to seize power. Um, So that happens. Now, the most plausible theory for the origin of the protocols as we know them is that Getch's novels, which are, again, a plagiarism, wound up in Russia. They were translated in 1872, and in 1891, a new edition was published, and the Council of Representatives meeting in Prague were consolidated under the name Rabbi's Speech. So the whole dialogue between Montesquieu and um, Machiavelli is like put in the mouth of a rabbi. This translation probably wound up in the hands of the Okhrana, and and specifically the Okhrana in France, because they have foreign offices just like the CIA. And the Okhrana see a use for this when the Dreyfus affair convulses France from 1893 to 1895. Now, we talk about Dreyfus in detail during Behind the Insurrections. The short of it is that he was a Jewish-French military officer falsely accused of selling secrets to the Germans after France's defeat in 1870. The case became a massive culture war issue in France. Dreyfus was acquitted, but the whole period spawned a bunch of fringe newsletters that blamed French defeat on this Jewish man. At the time, Russia was allied with Germany and France was her enemy. The same story we saw in 1806 repeated itself. The Tsar secret police created the protocols in order to pop up his conservative stances against a wave of liberal sympathy that kept pushing for reform. Since many prominent liberals were Jewish, a nice anti-Semitic conspiracy would help to divide the left and make regular Russians less likely to trust any reform. And that is more or less where the protocols of the elders of Zion came from. The Okhrana plagiarizes a work of plagiarism by oppression in order to like prop up the czar against liberals and it's it's again like that that first appeal in 1806 that first piece of big anti-semitic propaganda it's not meant to go worldwide it is meant to have a very specific impact within france and russia on a specific series of political issues but it fucking gets out of it breaks containment right like a virus and it goes viral immediately and within a few years the elders of zion the protocols of the elders of zion have spread all over the world we're gonna talk about fucking columbia in our next episode um and provided went on to provide like inspire slaughter and a all over the planet and provide a lot of the fuel for what became the Holocaust. Well, that's, that's the question I have is like, how does it spread like that? Like this isn't the internet doesn't exist and I'm an idiot. So I don't know how things, uh, we're going to break that down in part two. Hell yeah. I'm going to, we're going to talk about specifically the nation of Colombia, and I'll, I'll walk you through exactly how it spread throughout Colombia and the impact that it has, because it's very interesting. And the story in Colombia, similar things happen all over the world in different countries. I got you spread. Don't worry, we we bring it we bring it back to the Midwest too. Don't worry, uh, that, <laughs> a little don't bit. Worry, don't worry, just a little, a little bit. bit, just a little bit of Henry Ford. But first, first. <laughs> the, the, just a just a just teeny a bit. Of Not Henry as, there's Ford. a lot to say about him doing this. I didn't include a whole lot in here just because there's so much else to get over. But we'll do a Henry Ford episode at some point. Be a mm. long one. That yeah, guy, no good. No good. Not a not a nice dude. Well, you got any pluggables to pr- plug, Langston? Yeah, yeah. You can listen to to my podcast. It's called My Mama Told Me. It's available everywhere. We talk about conspiracy theories, and uh, I'm gonna use a lot of this information to apply to uh, my own nonsense. So this is exciting. Yeah. Well, I love. I don't know. I don't know. I don't love anything. Just crazy on. <laughs> Just Raytheon and killing the czar. I do love killing the czar. So why don't you all go out and while you wait for a part two, find a czar. You know, deal with him. Kill him. De- Fuck it. Kill him. Kill, kill a fucking czar. Go find a czar. Take him out. Get an old timey bomb and take out that czar. Yeah. One of those, you know, the kind like it's a big sphere. It's got like a little knob on the top. Yeah. And like a, a, yeah. Very like a long fuse. wick. 
just long extremely wick. long wick that burns pretty slow, but not slow yeah. enough for that czar to get away. You kill him. Not yeah, you you fucking take that czar out. <laughs> anyway, this is behind the bastards once again inciting violence against the Russian royal family, um, as is our wont. <laughs> 